We want to welcome our visitors. We're glad that you're with us. And we hope that you will stay afterwards to visit with us a little bit longer. This is our Friends and Family Day in which we've invited people to come to worship with us and to hear a message. And our message theme today has been, Does God Exist? You Can Know the Truth. And so we're going to continue that theme tonight as we consider creation from the perspective of God's Word. But not only that, creation from the perspective of science as well. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This morning we talked about how you can logically come to the conclusion by simple common sense methods that there is a God. To know the will of God, to know what God did in the creative process, you have to go to His special revelation that's found in the Word of God. That's why we're going to focus on that more so tonight than we did this morning. Because if you're talking to an atheist or someone who does not believe or is not sure whether God exists, they're not going to believe the Bible. You're going to have to use the concept of nature around you to convince them there had to be a creator. Then once that conviction is there, then you will turn them to the Word of God. I set forth this statement, and I believe this is the most logical, rational, and scientifically accurate depiction of the origin of the universe and the origin of the human race. It simply makes sense. It's something that we looked at this morning as far as cause and effect. When it comes to life coming from pre-existing life, And from the concept of design. Design demands a designer. Life demands someone that's a life giver. And the effect of the universe demands a cause. And that cause is God. In the beginning, God God created the heavens and the earth. But there is another world view that many are trying to teach many young people. And it's dominated our media. It has dominated the scientific community. And it's this world view. In the beginning, nothing produced a big bang, which created the heavens and the earth. That's what the atheistic community wants you to believe. They want you to believe that that is the thinking of man, that's the conclusions that the the wisdom of man has come to concerning the origin of the universe and your origin. But as we talked about it this morning, uh, the Big Bang does not, uh, is not an accurate depiction of an adequate cause for the universe. The Big Bang, if that's how it happened, and we know it's not how it happened because of Genesis 1-1, the Big Bang would be an effect. It wouldn't be a cause. The question is begged, what caused the Big Bang? Therefore, this, these two worldviews here, one from Scripture and one from the atheistic community, will determine many things concerning how people behave themselves, concerning people's uh, attitude towards morality, concerning whether people are accountable for their actions or not, whether there is a good or evil. If you do not understand fully where you come from, why you're here and where you're going then how you behave is not going to be what it should be. Genesis 1.1, the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, tells us precisely where we came from. Let's look at creation in the Bible. The Bible plainly sets forth creation. And what I mean by that, it sets forth God created out of nothing. God did not create make the universe, and then let it, through natural processes, over billions of years, produce life. That's what theistic evolution teaches. The Bible does not teach theistic evolution. Theistic evolution is the, the attempt to try to merge the theory of evolution, with it, which is atheistic, with the concept of, well, God did it. What they say basically is... 
that, yes, evolution is true, just God did it. But that's not the case when you go to the Word of God, God's special revelation. Genesis chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, He made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day that they were created. This is talking about what happened in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. The creation of man and woman. The creation of male and female. God created man in His image. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and 27. Man and woman created in the image of God. They were not evolved. They did not begin as some sort of primitive life form on earth. And then over billions of years, at a certain point, this ape-like creature, God somehow just infused it with a spirit in His own image. That's what theistic evolution teaches. The Bible does not teach that. God created man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Genesis chapter 2. God took a a rib from Adam's side after he caused Adam to have a deep sleep come upon him. Took that material and created a female gender of the male. And therefore you have the creation of man and woman by the creator himself. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 11, this is how long it took. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. You don't have to be a scholar in Hebrew to understand that. It doesn't take a PhD to understand that he did it in six days. Therefore, the Israelites were to work six days and then on the seventh rest because God created in six days, 24-hour period, and then rested. He ceased creation on the seventh day. So there, there is no place to put the millions of years or billions of years that you hear about in the media, that you hear about in documentaries, that you read about in biology books or geology books, that is part of the mythology of evolution. It's not a part of what you find in the actual history of the world that's found in the Word of God. Psalm 8. All throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we're going to find that the... Different writers of the 66 books of the Bible, probably 40 different authors, all are saying the same thing. God created. He created this world. Psalm 8, verses 3 through 5. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. We see here the dignity of being a human being. We did not evolve from the slime. We're not just a little bit higher than the chimpanzee. We are made a little lower than the angels. Do you see how that's going to affect people's mindset? If you think that you're just a little bit different, just a little bit different than a chimpanzee, how is that going to affect your behavior? If you are are being taught and it's being placed within your mind that you're nothing more than a very, very smart ape, should it not surprise us when teenagers start acting like animals? Because that's what they're taught they are. But if you're taught that you're made a little lower than the angels, that you've been created by God in the image of God, that's dignity. That's accountability. That means we owe God our allegiance. Therefore, we better behave as He has commanded us. See how that's a difference? It will affect society. And it has affected society. So we are made a little lower than the angels. God is concerned about Him. And the psalmist here is saying, when I consider the cosmos... The moon, the stars, and the, the vastness of the universe that you have made. What am I that you are concerned about me? But God does care about us. And therefore, we see that very plainly set forth in the Word of God. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4. 
The psalmist is saying, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard, and their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. So we see there that the heavens declare the glory of God. The universe shows God's handiwork. That goes back to the design argument that we made this morning. Design demands a designer. When you see orderliness, and when you see design, you logically conclude there must have been a designer. You know astronomers can predict when an eclipse is going to happen years ahead of time. You can mark it on your calendar when an eclipse is going to happen. A solar eclipse, a lunar eclipse. They can predict and say, okay, we're going to have a meteor shower in a few days. Because of the clockwork precision of this universe. Psalm 33, verses 6 through 9. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them, by the breath of His mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in the storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For He spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. That's exactly what you find in Genesis chapter 1. And God said, and it was so. He commanded, He spoke this universe into existence. The Latin phrase is ex nihilo, out of nothing. He is the cause, the effect is the creation. And therefore, He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Therefore, we see creation ex nihilo, out of nothing. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 6. You alone are the Lord. You have made the heaven and the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them. You preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. Here, God is being praised. He alone is the Lord. You've made the heaven and the heaven of heavens. All of the cosmos, from the furthest reaching reaches of the universe to the immediate atmosphere over our planet. He made it. He made the host of heaven, all the stars, all the different heavenly bodies that are out there. He made them. And He made the earth and everything on it, all the life forms on the planet, the sea and all that is in them, and He preserves them. That shows me that God is still involved in how things function. He preserves them. He didn't just make them, wind it up and just throw it out there. He preserves in His providential care this universe. All the host of heaven worships you. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 12. We talked about that that verse this morning. The hearing ear and and the seeing eye The Lord has made them both. Very simple, but yet profound. Profound statement. Uh, I believe it was Charles Darwin who said concerning the eye. He says, when I try to consider how the eye evolved, it leaves me cold. Well, there's no explanation for evolving the eye. And there's no explanation for evolving anything complex like the ear or the brain that processes that input, that information from the eye, from the ear. There's no accounting for that in nature. There had to be a designer. Matthew chapter 19, let's go into the New Testament. Jesus talked about creation. Matthew 19 and verse 4, And he answered and said, when they were asking him about marriage and divorce, He answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? At the beginning, God created man and woman. See, Jesus didn't believe in evolution. And he ought to know. He was involved in the creation of man and woman. And therefore, evolution cannot be fit into the biblical text. And so he says, God made them at the beginning male and female. He ought to know, John 1, verses 1 through 4, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. 
All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. He was part of the us in Genesis 1 and verse 26, when God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit involved in the creation of the human race. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, again, talking about Jesus. He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. That's very much what Nehemiah said. That God preserves all things. So Jesus Christ being deity, being God, being one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, He was uh, involved in the creation. That's why He's the firstborn over all creation, for by Him all things were created. He has preeminence over all creation because through Him everything was created. And so we see here that Jesus Christ, our Savior, before He became our Redeemer, He was our creator. Therefore, we give him all the glory, not only for being our redeemer, but also for being our creator as well. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3. By faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. That answers the whole concept. Well, is the universe eternal? Did the universe make itself? No. No. The world was not made by things which are visible. There's an invisible God that created everything. And we understand by faith the worlds were framed by the Word of God. And you know, atheists and and skeptics, skeptics balk at that and say, Oh, you rely upon blind faith. But you know, they have faith. They have faith that billions of years ago there was a big bang. They have faith that somehow on earth... Life just spontaneously created itself. That's their tenets of their faith. But they don't want to see it as faith. They want to see it as fact. But their faith is in something in the past that they have not observed. And they want to put it forth as scientific facts. When in reality, that's the tenets of their faith. The faith that we speak of is directed in the right direction. It is that God created the heavens and the earth. Hebrews 3 and verse 4, For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. We talked about this verse this morning. That's a very simple statement. That's very logical. Every house, every structure is built by someone. There's design there. You can come to the conclusion. There are architects, but he who built all things is God. Revelation chapter 4. The very last book of the Bible talks about creation. For you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So we see that we give praise, glory, and honor to God because He is the one who created all things. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Skeptics and atheists and agnostics are without excuse. There's no excuse for them. That's why Psalm 14 and verse 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. So it's been very clearly evident Since the beginning of mankind, the invisible attributes of God are seen in the creation. Do you know that's why that all of the people of the earth, even the most primitive people that are isolated from the rest of civilization, that's why they're religious? You go to the furthest reaches of the Amazon. You go to places where people are living in very primitive conditions. They are religious. Why? They have looked around and they say there must be a great spirit. There must be a power that created all this. 
There is an invisible realm. You don't find tribes of atheists. You don't find clans of agnostics. Man comes to the conclusion there has to be a power that created this, an intellect behind it. Now they're misguided. They don't understand. But they've come to the conclusion that this world was created and we have to take them the written revelation and show them this is who did it. It wasn't Buddha. It was not Krishna. It was not any Hindu deity. It was not some tribal god or great spirit. It was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We've got to take them that gospel. They already had the light of creation. We've got to take them the light of God's Word. Creation in the Bible. Now let's talk about creation and science. And some people think that those two are at odds with one another, but not really. They're not at all. There is a movement that is growing very powerful, uh, powerfully among scientists, and it's getting a lot of attention. It's called intelligent design. It's causing a lot of waves in the scientific community. It says this, the complexity found in the universe and in life forms implies an intelligent designer as the only logical source. And they talk about things, and again, I mentioned this DVD this morning, I want to mention it again tonight. Ben Stein, that's the man who narrates this DVD. Ben Stein's video called Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. If you get a chance to rent that, watch it. Rent it, buy it. You can buy it at Walmart. You can rent it from Blockbuster. It's an excellent video showing the, the scientific community is biased against this concept of an intelligent design. Because people don't want to have, as Romans 1 says, they don't want to have God in their knowledge. They want to give credit to, credit to nature, not the Creator for the origin of all things. And so this concept says that there has to be a designer. And, and they go and they, and they look and under their microscope and they, they, they come to what is called irreducible complexity. And what that simply means is there are certain things that have to be in place for these small life forms, these microscopic life forms to function and they all have to be in place all at once, all at the same time. You can't evolve something over here and then something over here. They all have to be there all at once for that life to function. And so they're saying, by looking at that, there had to be a creator. It had to be there all at once. There had to be something to design it. Intelligent design is proving to be problems with so many in the evolutionary community. It's this simple concept. A poem demands a poet. I mean, you come across a piece of paper with a beautiful poem on it. You don't say, well, look at that poem. It happened as a result of an explosion in a print shop. And the ink just kind of formed into words. And look at that beautiful poem. It just happened. Of course not. Building demands a builder. Again, we talked about this this morning. You don't get building material in a field, plant dynamite in it, or shoot a missile at it, and then the smoke clears, you have a structure. Explosions cause chaos. They don't cause complexity. Design demands a designer. DNA. You all have it. We all have it from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. It's the genetic information molecules of every cell. And we have trillions of cells in our bodies. I probably have a little bit more than the average person. But that's just more design, see? More proof of a designer. But it's the genetic information molecule that we have in our cells. There is enough information capacity in a single human cell to store the 30-volume Encyclopedia Britannica about four times over. Four times over. And that's in every cell of your body. The information capacity of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, in a volume the size of a pinhead. You look at a pinhead is equivalent to a stack of books 
500 times as tall as the distance from the earth to the moon. Now you multiply the distance from the earth to the moon, which is 240,000 miles, times 500. That is the information capacity that's found in a pinhead size dot of DNA. And I'm supposed to believe that just happened? That's just residue of an explosion billions of years ago? I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. It takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to believe in the Bible. My faith is too weak to be an atheist. Let's talk about the earth that we are on. 93 million miles from the sun, perfect distance. It was, if it was just a little bit further out, we would freeze to death. We couldn't have uh, life on earth. If it was just a little bit closer in, we'd burn up. We are perfectly the right distance from the sun. And by the way, just the right type of sun, the right type of star, the right type of light, the right type of conditions on the planet, the right type of core, the right type of magnetic field. I mean, on and on and on we could go. 240,000 miles from the moon. We have just the right type of moon. If our moon was any closer, we would have problems with our tidal waves. If it was even either further out, the oceans would stagnate because there would not be the tidal waves coming in and out, the tides coming in and out, which cleanse the coastlines. We'd have all kinds of problems. The moon is just the right distance, the right type of moon, the right composition, the right size. Our atmosphere that we're breathing right now, 21% oxygen in our atmosphere, just right. Just right for biological functions to operate within our systems right here. All the conditions on our planet are just right for life to exist. The universe was designed for our existence. Astronomer Robert Jastrow, who I think was an agnostic, he says this, If the universe had not been made with the most exacting precision, we could never have come into existence. It is my view that these circumstances indicate the universe was created for man to live in. You have to have the right conditions for life to exist on earth. That's why we haven't found life on Venus. That's why we haven't found life on Mars as desperately as they look. Because the conditions aren't right. The conditions had to be there. And this astronomer is admitting uh, it had to be precise for there to be life on earth. Astrophysics Sir Fred Hoyle said, A super intellect has monkeyed with the physics as well as with the chemistry and biology. Again, I think he's an agnostic, if not an atheist. It seems that a super intellect has monkeyed with things. Super intellect, God, a creator. These are people who are studying the sciences and they're saying, look, these are the conclusions we're coming to. Astronomer uh, uh, George Greenstein says this, as we survey all the evidence, the thought insistently arises that some supernatural agency, or rather agency, must be involved. It is, po- is it possible that suddenly, without intending to, we have stumbled upon scientific proof for the existence of a supreme being? Was it God who stepped in and so providentially crafted the cosmos for our benefit? The Bible says yes. It has said yes for at least 2,000 years and longer. Astronomer, or excuse me, astronaut John Glenn said this, It is the orderliness of the whole universe about us, from the smallest atomic structure to the most enormous thing we can imagine, galaxies billions of light years across, all traveling in prescribed orbits in relation to one another. Could this have just happened? I can't believe that. This was a definite plan. This is one big thing in space that shows me there is a God. 
Some power put all this into orbit and keeps it there. Here again, someone, John Glenn, who has a perspective that none of us have, who's not an atheist. He's coming to the conclusion there, there, had to, there has to be a designer. There has to be a God. God exists. God is. As we sang in the song, He is the great I am. He exists whether atheists want to acknowledge Him or not. One day they will acknowledge Him. Let's hope it's before it's too late for some. He does exist. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Job has a brilliant statement in Job 12, verses 7 through 10. But now ask the beast and they will teach you. The birds of the air and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth and it will teach you. And the fish of the sea will explain it to you. Who among these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Yes, our God, He is alive. Psalm 46 and verse 10, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The evidence is clear. For anyone who's honest with the evidence... One scientist made this statement. When an honest person studies the evidence long enough, it will force them to believe in God. The key word is honest. Perhaps you haven't responded to the Creator and you need to. The Creator became our Redeemer in the person of Jesus Christ. The man hanging on the cross in Nazareth wasn't just a peasant Jew from the city of Nazareth, that was God Almighty on the cross. Being separated from the Father for your sins and for mine. Believe in Him with all your heart. Confess He is the Son of God. Repent of your sins and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. Because He said, our Creator and Redeemer said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. If you've done that and you've gone astray, Repent. Come back to Him. As always, the choice is yours. While we stand and sing.